I'm really excited today because today in the studio I've got Dr. Steve Saunders with me and Steve has worked with me for a number of years and also my brother who is a surgeon. Firstly, welcome Steve. Thanks, thanks for being Danny. here. Great to be here and thanks for the invite. Pleasure. So Steve is a consultant, he's a clinician, he's a researcher and he's an educator. He's currently working with elite sporting teams that have won national and world championships in a variety of sports worldwide over the last 30 years. In Australia, Steve started working extensively with Geelong Football Club from late 2021 and they did win last year, so I'm sure Steve had a hand in that. Congratulations, Steve. Thank you. Um, he served professionally as Head of Science and Medicine at the Adelaide Football Club in 2019 and 2020 and was the High Performance Manager at the North Melbourne Football Club at 2010 to 2017. So for me, as one of his patients over some of this time, it's been a little bit hard to get into you, Steve, but um, I do manage to get in there and um, I certainly do come to you when I have um, chronic injuries. So thank you because you've recently fixed my hamstring very quickly and that's been chronic for two years. Steve is also founder and director of Kanga Tech, an injury prevention and performance testing and training platform developed for sports science medicine and therapy that is now utilised extensively in elite sport, medical and research institutions worldwide. So he's director of uh, Saunders Physiotherapy here in Adelaide and is an adjunct senior research fellow at the University of South Australia, Adelaide. So welcome, Steve. It is a real pleasure and honour to have you here to share your knowledge and I really appreciate your time and being here today. Thanks for the invite, Anna, and that, and that, that bio is far too long, I think. Um, I... No, it's not at all. I'm sure there's more that you can tell us. So that's where I want to start. Sure. Tell us about your background before we move on, because today um, Steve's going to talk to us about beginning to exercise and starting to run and the importance of um, different elements and tips that he can give us. So firstly, tell us about you, Steve. My background, gee, I, I mean, I'd, I studied physiotherapy at Sydney University. And I graduated and I was working as a physiotherapist for about 10 years or so. And then I felt that we uh, I was right into exercise therapy because I was a hurdler and a rugby player as well. So I, I love my sport and I love being fit. And I had my fair share of injuries. So I've felt a lot of my patients' pain, believe me. And um, I just felt like I, I'd, I'd been a clinician for 10 years and I was working with some reasonably elite athletes and I just felt like the exercises we were prescribing we were prescribing based on the anatomy and architecture of muscle we didn't really know what would be most efficacious or most effective for them so I rang around and spoke to a few of my early mentors and peers and they all said well if you want those sort of answers you're going to have to answer them yourself and do a PhD wow so that that's that's where I lost my hair and became old and grumpy. So I started doing a neuroscience PhD that looked into lumbo pelvic hip control during running. Mm -hmm. And we measured muscle activity and motion and breathing patterns and all sorts of things. And we compared normal people to people with a history of pain. What exercise therapy is likely to be more effective for people that run and exercise? Oh, perfect. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, so it was thanks. great. And, and, and it was off the back of that, that I was still working in the clinic and still working at the University of Queensland where I did my PhD with uh, Professor Paul Hodges there, a wonderful team of researchers there at, at that institution. They're still doing really, really powerful work that's helping on so many levels. Yeah, so I was still working there and then I started getting sort of invitations to come and help some elite sporting teams. Oh, we're having hamstring problems or we're having groin problems where you come and help. So it it's all just sort of morphed from there until I finally got the offer to take on a full-time role at North Melbourne Football Club when Brad Scott called me and said, come and help the kangaroos. Fabulous. And yeah. that you did. And that I did. And it's <laughs> it's just gone from there. So look, I've, I've been blessed. I mean, the opportunity to still do my clinical work, to do some research, to work with these elite sporting teams, whether it's in the NBA or the EPL or the AFL, and, and to learn so much from the work you do with them because they are pushing the boundaries. Mm, absolutely. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's just been a blessing. Oh, well, congratulations. Mm. I know that's a lot of hard work in there. So um, sure. thanks for being here to share that with us today. So no I, I coach people on a different level, I guess, to that, Steve, but it all, is all applicable, and that is yeah. people who are starting to exercise and people who are beginning to run. So I have an online marathon program yeah. that takes people from their couches, basically, to running a marathon in 12 months. The awesome. essence of that program is it's easy. It's small steps, yeah. so nothing too big. So they start off walking. Right. But some people are really enthusiastic when they start, 
and uh, that's when the biggest risk of injury is. What What are your tips for someone who's just starting to exercise, say who are, who's wow. in their 30s or 40s and hasn't exercised for 20 years, still has that memory recall yeah. that they could sprint when yeah, they were yeah, younger yeah. and they were fit and healthy like I did and, you know, you get injured very quickly. <laughs> for sure, absolutely. And look, that... Although I spent a lot of my time working at that elite end, in the clinic I see these people too, you. As, 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 as you know. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and this work you're doing with this large group of people is really important and something I'm quite passionate about and that's why I'm here. Um, because these people do need to get exercising and get healthy and for want of a better word, just get well again because they're living a life that's not the life they want to live and they want to get going. And it can be incredibly frustrating if every attempt is thwarted by a tendon issue or a stress fracture or whatever it is that limits different people. So mm. it, it, it can be really challenging and the different hurdles that can crop up for people are very different depending upon your body type and your training background and the, and the way you go about starting. So it, it, even just from the beginning, your comments there about it's got to be easy, it's got to be small steps, it's got to be gradual, spot on. Mm-hmm. And if it needs to start walking, Great. Because what happens is like the people that are often at most risk are those that haven't done anything for ages, maybe never have or used to, but they haven't done anything for ages. And they've got the aerobic capacity, let's say, or the natural cardiovascular fitness, and they've got the natural movement efficiency that's quite inherent to go out there and run six, seven, ten K off nothing. Yep. They've got the capacity to get going and we'll see really early rapid gains. They've also got the capacity to injure themselves pretty quickly because there's no getting around the fact that your tendons and your bones have been relatively deloaded or unloaded for a long period of time. And those sort of structures don't like change. Yeah. So you've almost got this motor that'll let them do a lot early, but they've got a chassis or a system that's still got to be slowly built up. Mm. So it's not a message of don't run. It's yes, get out there, get out there and exercise, do more, Mm -hmm. but do it at a rate that's appropriate for your body Mm -hmm. and your, 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 um, natural level of fitness, um, and your training history. Mm -hmm. So they're they're the things you're always balancing. You know, when we get people coming to the clinic and say, I want to start running or whatever, they're they're the things that we will go through. What have you done before? What's your injury history been? And and then we can do some profiling and have a look at their tendon health and their tendons and their their bone structure and the way they move and how strong they are Mm -hmm. or how weak they are in the muscles most important for running and walking. Yeah, and that as a trainer is um, really important because I really do encourage people to go and get a health assessment first because yep. people really don't know their strengths and weaknesses in their body. And I'm still learning no. today. You know, I've been running for 17 years and I still know there's weaknesses and we're doing um, yes. that. I'm doing that with you now through that Kanga Tech, which I'm, you know, really excited about. But it's, and it, it's, it moves too, doesn't it? So your strengths and weaknesses change. Do you suggest that people get that assessment done? I do, especially if, like, even if you're going to do it gradually and you're going to do it slowly, um, it still helps even if you're doing that. And and sometimes you might go slower than you need to, too. Like, yeah. you might actually profile better than you thought you would. Mm-hmm. And you're able to start at a higher level or to accelerate those loads a little bit faster. One of the things I've learned through this world of science and objectivity after having done a neuroscience PhD is... We would, in the clinic, we would make assessments based on how people move and we'd make some, take some rudimentary measures. And I thought I had a pretty good feel on where someone was strong or weak based on the way they moved. Yeah. Right? And I was so often so wrong. (laughs) So once we suddenly had the capacity to not just look at how they move, but accurately measure where they're strong and where they're weak around the hip, around the knee, around their ankle, Mm -hmm. and put those two things together, Mm -hmm. we'd actually come up with quite different training plans and progressions because that information was really important. And you can't eyeball it. You sort of need to measure it. Yeah, right. And so when they have that measure, then they know what to do, what to work on. Exactly. Yeah. And, And then in terms of targets, you can sort of say to them, look, when we get your strength levels up to here in this region of your body, Mm. you'll you'll be much more likely to cope with these sort of loads. So until we get them up to here, and this might take six weeks or so to get you up to here, let's keep the loads at about this level. Mm. Let's build a foundation of strength that's going to help protect your tendons and your bones 
you're still exercising, you're still getting fitter. We're just being smart about how we do it yeah. so that you don't get injured. Yeah, and that's, that's really important care. for me as a trainer working with health professionals like yourself is to yep. communicate with each other about somebody's um, training program. Spot on. Yeah. Yep. What, what would be the basics from you about someone starting in terms of exercises that they could do to start loading and to start preparing themselves? to run yeah great question so just in that running world one of the things you said before about just i might start someone walking that's great mm -hmm. and a step that's often missed is the intermittent jog walking yeah you know so, so just letting someone might be able to run continuously for half an hour off no training but if he does if he or she does that repetitively over and over again and they've got tendons that are detrained they they could develop an issue um, or they're likely to develop an issue whereas if if they started, if one run in the week was continuous and two other runs initially were a combination of three minute run, one minute walk intervals, or wherever they look as though they need to start, that's giving their tendons and bones a chance to not have their chronic cyclic stress that can see them start to slide backwards. You know, yeah. so so just that intermittent walk run mm -hmm. is a, is a, is a great place to start. Yep, and that's exactly what we start in our programs too. Perfect. Is walk running and and we always say just if it's easy, finish easy and don't want to do any more. So you finish thinking, yeah. oh, that was easy. I could keep going. Great. Stop. Great. Great rule of thumb. <laughs> yeah. 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 Fantastic. And if you've got a bit of an eagle and something's a little bit sore and you're starting with your walk run and it quickly goes away and it's okay, then, then that's okay. Like some, sometimes people can become quite fearful of aches and pains that are just a normal part of the process of loading the body again too. Mm. And in the long term, that can get in the way of them developing a, a chronic training load that actually protects them. Yes. So it's, it's a really sort fine of balance, balance isn't between it? between all of those things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a really fine balance between doing starting, doing too much and not doing enough too. Like mm. it's, it's, and... For me, it's getting people out the door, starting that routine. Just get out the door, just walk, and make it easy. Spot on. Yep. Because we often he hear about the we hear about um, overload or overtrading, yeah. And but th th that's all relative. Because mm. if you've done more and you've got a chronic training load, it's harder to overtrain than if you've done nothing. <laughs> so you can protect against overload by actually doing more, but you've just got to do it at the right rate and in the right way. Mm. Yeah. So you're talking a lot about tendons too. Can you tell me about the importance of tendons and how we load tendons and how we yeah. decrease load and what how important that is for running? Yeah, so so they're really important. When we when we run, most of the energy we, we use is from eccentric muscle contraction. So we lay, we, we basically land on our foot and our calf muscle is sort of contracted, for example, if we think of just the, the calf and the Achilles tendon. And like, calf muscle contracts and the Achilles tendon gets stretched like an elastic band and it stores that energy and it releases it. And the really good runners are really good with their foot strike and where they position their body. And they line the system up so that they can store a lot of energy in that Achilles tendon and use it like an elastic band. And so it's good in terms of energy efficiency, but it, but it requires a certain amount of coordination and it requires a really... Um, healthy Achilles tendon that's got the right amount of stiffness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so when we start to run, there's a lot of load on the tendons like the Achilles tendon, the patella tendon, and the gluteal tendon, because they're all having to store and release energy to different degrees depending upon how how well we run. Yes. Yeah. Um, and if your tendon hasn't done that for ages, mm -hmm. it's a hell of a shock to it. Yeah. Ten tendons love things staying the same. Right. They hate change. Okay. Having said that, if you put load on them and give them chance to adapt, yep. they will adapt, mm -hmm. and 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 so they will become thicker and stiffer and better, if you like. Yeah. So, what we do know about tendons, for example, is when we give them some load, some overload that really stresses them a little bit, like a new load, like I do my first jog run in ages. Yeah. They will initially sort of fill up with fluid, and then and they'll start adapting, and then they'll lose some of that fluid, and they'll be thinner. Mm -hmm. and then they'll come back to homeostasis, and that takes about three days. Right. Right. So there's changes happening in the tendon Yes. Um, that, that take about 72 hours to do their thing. And right? so does that mean you need recovery in between that 72 hours? Yeah. So if, 
it, and and it's not to say you can only run three days apart. Yes, that, that's yes, crazy. Yeah, sure, um, but with tendons, you've got to give them a load and then give them time to adapt. Mm -hmm. And if you hit them with too much load before they're fully adapted, you might blunt that adaptive response, mm -hmm. or you may start some micro injury. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. So that that's where you've got to be careful. So you might. You might have your bigger running days, your heavier loads that really stress your tendons out. Initially, you, you might have them three or four days apart to, yep. to give your tendons plenty of time to adapt. But it's not to say that in between you can't do some smaller loads. That that that's right. still or different. Yeah. Different training. Yeah. yeah. You you might do some cross training. You might do a lighter jog walk and some strength training yes. before you do another long run. Yes, and that's interesting. Yep. I was talking to a beginner runner the other day and he was saying that he was doing 1K every day. I said, why are you doing 1K every day? Why don't you just have do it three times a week and do strength training because you'll get more bang from your buck because he can't run seven days where he's only got three toes. Um, so, yeah. uh, you know, I was saying you've got, just got to decrease it and um, he wants to get to a marathon in 11 months, but there's no way that you can run every day, um, particularly when you've got a chronic injury such yep. as three toes yep. so you know decreasing that load but using other things that you can do so concentrating on what you can do rather than what you can't and strength training i believe and i know you believe is very important strength training is huge so having a, what we call we, we refer we call a strength reserve so being strong enough um, makes you more able to perform the task you've got a better capacity to perform the task well mm -hmm. But also what, what, what comes almost secondary to that is in, a, in, a, in acquiring a good level of strength, you've loaded tissue like the tendon attached to the muscle and the bone attached to the muscle. You've loaded this, this other tissue at a higher level than it's going to be loaded when you run, for example. Mm -hmm. So you've got a better tissue tolerance. Mm. So yeah, the muscle's stronger, but you've made the tendon and the bone more tolerant of load because you've put it through almost a super maximal tensile or compressive load. And that prepares it, you, like you go out and run and it's not as much load, yeah, it's cyclic and it happens for longer, but you've shielded the tissue by providing some good stimulus through strength training. That's really interesting because, so, you know, I do strength training with my people yeah. and often we go out to running events and we compete against people that are runners and they run all the time. But we often come up trumps because, I, and I believe it's from the strength training, we, we, we're we stronger on the hills particularly. Yep. Um, and and I, it's not that we do any more running, but it in the end well, it seems that we're faster and we've got the endurance and our bodies hold up. So there's re there's growing evidence now, and look, it's been around for a long time. Yeah. But, but it, and and it, and it's just growing that um, improving strength, for example, around the hip, or the calf, or the foot intrinsics, um, it can improve running speed mm -hmm. and running efficiency slash measures of endurance. Yeah. yeah. So being stronger helps running performance. Some people think, well, sure, it's all about specificity. So yeah. If I go out and run, or converse, I go out and play football, that'll get me strong for football or that'll get me strong for running. And there is some, some advantage in context specificity of exercise and load. So, yeah, you've got to be specific to a point. Mm. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's also a lot to be said for just having strength. And it doesn't have to be – it can be from the gym and then it can transfer over into running. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's good research to show that getting stronger around the hip can reduce the risk of injury and improve running speed and running efficiency. Yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. investing in some gym work mm -hmm. can make you a better runner mm -hmm. and make you less likely to get injured. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, like you said before, you can't run ev every day. And, and think you're just going to keep getting better. You, you, like you're going to hit this ceiling. You re reach a point, don't you? And yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. And strength training is a really important part of not, not just preparing for getting into running and running marathons, but I'd like to see it be an, an, an important part of school physical education programs. Mm. And, I, and I'd mm. like to see more of the elderly engaged in strength training. I mean... Osteoarthritic knees, osteoarthritic hips, all these people that are being told it's wear and tear, do nothing. We're doing them harm, a lot of them, yeah, because a lot of them would benefit from strength training mm -hmm. and actually loading these joints. And mm -hmm. there's a growing body of evidence to suggest that's a better way to manage them than saying, don't wear out this knee anymore. Yeah, isn't that interesting? And, yeah. and it's good that there's people like you out there that when people come to them, 
that say keep moving, keep doing it and, and don't prevent them from moving. There was yeah. a lady that I was training and I think when she came to me she was 55 and her bone density was, you know, that of a 65-year-old. She trained with me for maybe a year and then her bone density was that of a 25-year-old. So she just through the strength training. It wasn't a lot. You know, mm. people think they have to do a lot but their health yeah. has become so much better and she was so happy about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's surprising the magnitude of change you can get in bone and tendon and in general fitness and in health. And if we go to the extremes in cognition, right. in memory, mm -hmm. in myelination of the brain, even <laughs> with the right sort of training loads, you know, we talk about strength. Train, like doing some strength work just two or three times a week can make a massive difference to many of those things. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. So it's pretty good bang for your buck. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. only we could make a tablet for that. I think people would take the easy way and take the tablet. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But they can't, so people have to do work. No. And, and it's not it's not really and work if they can find something they enjoy. Correct. And what's working against that to some extent in schools, for example, now, is a lot of the PE programs are let's play a sport. Mm. We'll do badminton. Yes. We'll do track. We'll do basketball. We'll do yes. football. And that's all great. Yes. Get the kids out there, be active. If that was supplemented with some foundational movement training and resistance training, it, it would be even more effective. And mm -hmm. I think we'd end up with a lot less people with sore backs and worn out joints and um, having those sorts of issues that are a burden on the Medicare system and seeing people not happy. Mm. Yeah. It'd be great to have that through the schools. Would be. And because I think the other thing with schools is that they're always concentrating on winning and when you don't, don't win, you, lo you lose, so you, you give up. So, you know, there's lots of kids that stop and then when girls get to puberty they stop they stop exercising so there's all these things that prevent whereas if we concentrated on the beauty of moving and strength rather than just winning or losing and um taught people Agreed. that their bodies were amazing then and and gave them the right instruction and how they could best enjoy their lives with their bodies rather than yeah. winning losing failing not failing um it would be wonderful and, would be, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be wonderful. And even with older age, you know, there's lots of people that can't afford to do the exercise and just having a great conversation with Oz Active about that, how they could implement programs for older people um, because there's loneliness and they can't move and, you know, a bit of movement changes someone's whole life really, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And there's some communities around the world that just seem to be a bit better at keeping strength training and fitness well, I'm reading a longer? yeah, I'm reading a book, uh, Ikuki. Uh, it's a Japanese book, and they're talking about the oldest people in the world. And there's a big percentage of them over 105 in this one p town, 25 percent or something. Mm -hmm. And they put it down to movement, and exactly what you've said: movement, mm -hmm. purpose, brain, yeah. purpose. That's their purpose, and they're doing what they love. Spot on. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's a lot to be said for it. There is. So going back to uh, we, um, we, <laughs> we digress. Yes, yeah, yeah. but going back to the simple um, exercises for physio. So, yep. so for someone starting out Such and they running. yeah starting running, what what exercises could they do at home? So think about running, and think about what muscles and joints you're going to load a fair bit. And obviously, you think lower limb, mm -hmm. and you think calf muscles and thigh muscles and hip muscles. Yeah. So some simple capacities that are important. Let's let, let let's take the calf and Achilles tendon and the foot, for example. Yes. So if someone wants to get into some running and 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 stretch that out to endurance, and they come into the clinic, and like we can accurately measure the strength of all of these things, and we do that. But a general test at home is: can you stand on one leg um, near a wall? You can put a finger on a wall for touch balance. <laughs> yes. And can you stand on one leg and you can do a slow, controlled, one second up, one second down heel raise, mm -hmm. working the calf muscle, keeping even balance through the big toe and the little toe so you're not inverting and rolling out onto the outside of your foot and using the wrong balance of muscles or the recruitment pattern is not ideal. So working all your foot and calf muscles nicely. Can you do 25 of those? Mm. Right. And you'll be surprised the number of people that couldn't do five. Mm. And I've seen in AFL programs, AFL players that are running 15 kilometres a game, when you isolate a test and they're wondering why their Achilles tendon is a problem and you measure their strength and it's down, and, but you just look at a simple heel raise test and you put them on a metronome and you get them to use the right technique and you test that, and they can do 11. Yeah. And that guy's covering 15K in a game on the weekend. He's got to be compensating some way. But what what's happening there what what else is being loaded more as a result of this lack of 
calf muscle capacity. Well, I know that you're doing that with me at the moment and, and I can't do it properly because I've been Great. Uh, inverting outwards too. So yeah, yeah, it yeah. is something that I'm, I'm working on because I have had these hamstring and back issues and it's probably all coming from that. Correct. And we're all really good at adapting. Mm -hmm. We're all really good at compensating. So we can have these deficiencies in certain muscle groups, or have these poor movement patterns, and, and we just find a way around them. And it's, it's good to keep running, it's good to keep training, and, and I get it, and that's yes. fine, but if you can, you know, before you start building your running out, if you can just get some of these simple efficiencies checked and find where your little weak points are and have those capacities built up, mm -hmm. your likelihood of doing better sooner and not getting injured is far greater. So you can do similar things around the hip. So mm -hmm. can you can can you lay on your back and mm -hmm. could you put your leg up on a on the coffee table at home with your hip at about you know sixty degrees and your knee slightly bent and your heel on the coffee table? Make sure it's not going to tilt over. Um, and can you slowly lift your backside up and down through a full range of motion, keeping your pelvis level without it listing or rotating? And can you move up and down smoothly and do what we call a single leg hamstring bridge? Mm -hmm. How many of those could you do? And, mm. you know, can you do the same number of those? Or by the time you get to five or six, are your hamstrings cramping and screaming? And is that because your hamstrings are weak or is that because you're doing it all with your hamstrings and not, and not with your glutes at all? Mm. So is there an imbalance in how you recruit or is there and some sort of inf inefficiency in how you recruit the muscles around your hip and your thigh? And these are all of the things mm. we can just quickly check. And then, mm -hmm. well, the solution is simple. You can just give people some simple home exercises mm -hmm. that can be built into a warm-up yes. or a warm-down. Or a program. Or to be done on your off-running days. Yep. It's not onerous. might be... A 10 or 15 minute little circle of... Well, mine's barely two minutes, so I well, there you no go. excuse. Exactly. <laughs> Are you doing it? Yes, I am. Good. And Good. I don't want to demonstrate for you today no, because you're, you're a hard, hard taskmaster. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit specific about technique, aren't we? Yeah, I hear that all the time. Um, but yeah, like it doesn't have to be onerous. And it, and it can literally be, like people get into a routine of, I like to run an exercise in the morning and I've, I've, I've got a dog that makes sure I get out the door and do Dogs it. Dogs are good. Right. So I just get out and I do my run on my walk with the dog and I come back and I've got a group of exercises that I do and I, I, and I go through and that gets me going and it, it gets rid of a lot of my aches and pains and prevents them being a problem. And, and, and importantly for two, you're up early and you're getting a good three hours of daylight at the start of the day. Yeah. You'll sleep much better. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, there's all these knock-on effects of exercise and a good routine of exercise and daylight hours and that sort of thing that really help us just be yeah healthy. well I, I think because you know I do wake up at 4 30 and other people wake up at 7 30 well I'm literally getting an extra day a week yep. than most people it's 21 hours a week that I'm getting extra on top of people yeah, yeah, yeah. so you know in that sense you can get a lot more done too yeah and, and those first few daylight hours are really important in what sense or just in terms of setting your body clock and getting your sleeping pattern like if you're doing that, you'll go to sleep much better at the other end of the day. Yeah, that's interesting because a lot of people say, yeah. oh, I can't sleep at night. And I'm like, well, just try and get up early or do some exercise. Sleep. And then a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to bed so early. I'm like, well, that's because the sun comes up. That's when you're supposed to be getting up. When the sun goes down, that's when you're supposed to be going to sleep. That's 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 the way life is. Which, which, which goes a bit to your other question about tips for when you get running. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. some of this happens organically because as people get running, they, they, they can only fit it in the morning because they've got a full-time job. So they get up earlier yeah. and they get the daylight hours and they get the exercise. And as soon as you're doing that, you don't crave the sugar and, you know, and, and the diet gets better um, and your sleep gets better. Oh, tick, tick, tick. Yeah. You're sleeping, you're eating better, you're doing strength training, you're exercising. Great. You'll and you feel, feel better. better and then your relationship's better and everything's Correct. better. Yeah, Correct. life's better. There's some people who get up early and do all of that, but they'll still burn it at both ends. Oh, I can't do and that. And so they're, they're too old. Me, me too. <laughs> me too. Um, but they're the ones who'll slow, like if you're not getting enough sleep, yes. the likelihood of injury does increase. Yes, yeah, sleep is a number. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big thing. A big part of recovery. Yeah. And yeah. it's a big thing, isn't it? I learned, yeah, I've. I've yep. since learned a lot about um, sleeping because I have found out I'm a narcolept, so I do sleep a lot. Wow. Um, but that's another story. Yep. But um, in terms of, um, you were touching on it before, you run and then you do your exercises. Is there a better way to exercise? Is there, you know, a warm-up? What do you suggest about warm-up, warm-down, stretching? What, what's your philosophy oh, or your wow. ideas that's on all this? A, Sorry. I'll never session this. <laughs> that's cool. Let's start with stretching. Yeah. Overrated. 
Okay. In, in, in terms of injury prevention, not a good amount of literature to, to suggest it'll do anything. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what I see is a lot of people, oh, I do 20 minutes of roller and I do all this stretching and then I go for my run and I still get sore. And I go, well, I've got nothing against the stretch and the roller, but I've just asked you to do some strength exercises and you tell me you don't have time. Let's swap it. Uh -huh. Bin the roller. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And give me that chunk of time to do strength exercises and it's game on. Right. In terms of getting rid of your, your aches and pains. And pains. Okay. So just in terms of utility or life efficiencies, you know, some people are investing time in things that aren't going to help them because mm -hmm. they don't know any better. Right. right. But what we do know is that strength and movement control is far more valuable in terms of injury prevention than passive stretching. Okay. Every now and then after we've profiled someone in a particular sport, doing a particular activity, we will come across a limitation in range of motion that we think could contribute to their injury. So they'll get a specific mobility or stretching routine for that. For that flexibility. Right. Yep. But more often than not, there's a stronger correlation between excessive mobility or hypermobility and injury risk right. than there is between lack of flexibility. Is that right? Control. Oh, absolutely. So if someone said to me, you can only stretch or do strength work, you're not allowed to do any stretching, you can only do strength, or you're not allowed to do any strength, you're only allowed to do stretching, and you've got to stay healthy and do sport, I'd take the strength work every day of the week. Right. Okay. Yep. So... People should have a bit of a think about that because building some simple strength and strength endurance based exercises into your warm up and warm down yes. will warm you up. Yes. Like stretching doesn't warm you up. Yeah. It doesn't increase your core body. Like, so if you increase your core body temperature a degree or two, the force a muscle can produce goes up 13 to 15% just by being warm. Mm -hmm. Do not increase your body temperature by stretching. Yeah. yeah. Well, this makes me feel so much better because yep. I do a lot more strength than I do stretching. That's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. I'm on the right track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And, and, and so like, one of the things we used to see years ago is you, you go out to the local track or whatever and you see a sporting group doing their warm-up. They jog a few laps. And then they'd all sit down and just stretch. They'd stretch, And okay. they'd talk and they'd stretch, whatever. And then they'd get up and they'd start doing run-throughs. And you think, you've just... Wasted. Cooled down. You got a bit warm. Yeah. And now you've just totally cooled down. And now your run throughs are really just warming you up again. Yeah, right. And if, if you looked at what the East Germans were doing years and years ago, I worked with one of the the best East German coaches years and years ago in track and field. Their their, their warm up was totally dynamic. Right. You were lathered in sweat after twenty minutes by the time you finished the warm up. Right. Any stretching that was in there was active range of motion. Didn't they control. hide this like away from people for a while? I can remember someone telling me about this recently. They, oh, they, hid kept, it. they kept much of what they did pretty hidden. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, and then I fortunately, when, when the wall came down, everything opened up a little bit. We started getting some insight into the way they trained. And it turned out that a lot of their head track and field coaches at the time, the sort of training they went through, they actually did five years of physiotherapy and paramedical training before they became head, head, head coaches of track or gymnastics or whatever. So the, the, these guys were really quite knowledgeable about the body and physiology and mm. biomechanics and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Now you see a lot more active warm-ups. Yes. You know, you, you, you don't see as much passive stretching now generally. But for the people that aren't educated, um, they, they think, oh, I'm still getting domsy, I'm still getting, so I've got to stretch more. Mm. So they do more calf stretching. Yeah. And if their problem is with the Achilles tendon, uh, tendon, the stretching and excessive stretching, one won't help. Two, it can actually irritate it and make it worse. Well, it's interesting so you say that. they're sort of not helping themselves. Yeah, I did that. I went, because I'm a little bit competitive, I went to a yoga class <laughs> and I was stretching the hamstring and I taught, well, a small grade, but it, yeah. it, I injured my hamstring. Yep. And I'm sure that's part of what it is today because I overstretched it. Yeah. So tendons, especially if they're irritated tendons and their attachments and all the structures around they don't like compression so if you're doing like for, for example if we're starting heel raise strengthening exercises for an acute achilles tendon we'll often start them above the ground level so you don't drop your heel down below the step in mm. the early stages of that sort of loading program because the more you stretch it on the way down the more you're compressing the tendon against the bone 
Mm -hmm. And that would just irritate it. So you start up with your heel way off the ground. You start in mid to inner range and you get some tensile load through the tendon, which will help it settle and heal without compressive load. Yeah. So that's just one of the mechanisms through which overstretching can aggravate a tendon. Mm. So that's interesting. So with a run, you know, often I just go out and have a run and I always my first one or two Ks is slower than the next three, four, five. Would you consider that a warm up or would you? Yeah. Con yep. So that's fine to just to go out. Just start easy. Yep. Start easy. Start easy. And, and you know, if you want to do the idea of warm up, if you've got a couple of muscle groups that maybe you have, have been a bit lazy and, and like your physio is talking about needing to get your glute meat a bit stronger and working a bit better to help support your hip joint or something like that. Before you do your run and you start slowly, you might just do one or two sets of light glute meat exercises that your physio has given you to just mm. almost prime that muscle and wake it up and get it working and then start your run. You don't have to, but that's one of the ways you might titrate in some of your neuromuscular retraining mm -hmm. within your week by doing some sort of exercise before and after your run that's appropriate for what you need. So after as well, so a little bit before after, maybe other. After can really help recovery, like right. active active movement mm -hmm. um, can really help facilitate your recovery. So we, we did some work on this at a couple of the football clubs that I've worked with where we looked at how athletes were recovering from games. And so it's pretty well known that there's certain muscle groups after a game of AFL football that will take two to three days to recover. To, so you test their strength before the game. Right. They go out there and they play a game of football and you test them every day after that. And there's some research that's come out that showed it can take about 50 hours or so. Before you get back to that start again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and come back stronger sometimes, I guess, too, maybe? Oh, uh, not, not so much within a week. Right. But, but, but just, just, just in terms of... Recovery. Mm -hmm. So, a group at the AIS and Paula Charlton have done some work on them. They've done a few really good studies in that in that space, showing that mm. what 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 we've played with in the field is well, can we facilitate that recovery a little bit? What can we do with that? And what we've found is that if and so that's let's say athletes footballers have recovered strength in particular muscle groups by game plus three, so by the third day. Right. So we use that as a bit of a monitoring measure to determine whether or not they're ready to train fully again. Right. Yeah. But then we've played with that and put interventions on day one and day two to see if we can speed that up. Yep. And certainly getting active movement involving um, light to moderate level isometric and isotonic contractions happening. So some light resistance work mm -hmm. early in the week mm -hmm. can certainly speed that up in a number of players. Is that right? Yeah. So we'd like to get the guys moving and we get them in the gym early. Yeah, right. And yeah. and that's what I, you know, after long runs, I often say just the next day, go go out for a light run, you know, don't don't stop or, you know, people will run a marathon and they won't run for another four weeks because they think they've done their marathon, but it's kind of got to keep your body moving or, or it sets it back. Or I get sore if I don't move, actually. My, that's when my, I'm in trouble with my back and things. But, uh, you know, I know that I have an exercise, like, oh, I've got to get out the door and once I start moving again, I feel better. Yeah, so so even just some light running the day after. You know, the day after a football game, you're bruised, you're battered, you're sore. So some, some easy stride throughs and some light resistance work can be really useful in terms of making sure you, you're not here for main training on Wednesday. You're actually up yeah. here in yeah. terms of, and then what happens? Everyone's ready to train at a higher level. The training session is more productive. Yep. The skill level is better. The intensity is better. The energy of the group is up. The coaches are happier because mm -hmm. everyone's not running around sort of at three-quarter pace. Yes. And you know, before you know go. it, you've strung together eight weeks in a row that are 20% better each week than what they would have been if you're not recovering as well. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's how you get better. And recovery... What do you think of ice baths and things like that? Like in terms of there's now the plunge pools and things around and things like that. What what do you think yeah. about that for recovery? I and love, also the compression things. That yeah. You, um, yeah. Compression, we use that. Ice baths, we use that. Use the ice baths at the right time. Right. And what's the right time? Oh, that's a good question. Because <laughs> um, we're always learning a lot, aren't we? Yes. And there's always research that comes out and says, hey, what, you, what you're doing, doing is wrong. Right. <laughs> um, so as a general rule of thumb, Ice baths or cold water immersion after aerobic exercise is really effective. Right. Great. Right. Be careful after strength training. Right. Right. Because it can blunt the adaptive response to strength training. It's called the, M ah. the mTOR response. Uh -huh. So 
when you do strength work, you don't get stronger when you're doing the strength work. You get stronger after it. Yes. So you stimulate your body and this mTOR response happens. All these hormones run around and you start building more muscle and That's why you need the and protein and all this stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, right. So that's all happening. And there's some evidence showing that the cold water immersion can blunt that. Yeah, right. So you don't want to do it. You don't want to do your cold water Ooh. immersion generally after weights. Okay. So of course, all those players that used to say to us, see, I told you I don't have to do the ice baths. <laughs> some of them were right. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we use them at particular times. Yes. And so after a big running session, that's, a, yep, we'll do it then. After a game where you've had the big running session in AFL footy, because they've, they've run a huge number of Ks, and they've also got bumps and bruises, great then too. Right. Yeah. But after strength sessions, no, we don't. Okay. Well, that's really good because I'm yeah. starting my runs at, at um, Plunge Pool, I think, and then going to end them my long runs that anyone can join me on cool. um, on Sundays. And um, because we really enjoyed that last year for our uh, progression to the New York Marathon, and I took a number of beginners, but we we just naturally did it on Sundays and it was beautiful after our long runs. And then we'd put the... Uh, one of those leg, the leg compressions on as well, and it was great. it was great mentally too because we got to chat with everyone as well. So we, we were getting, you know, help. it helped in lots of ways. Yeah, and and, and believe it or not, soreness uh, starting to show their efficacy in some good research now in terms of helping recovery. Right. Um, so yeah, so we're we're using the, the heat at certain times and the cold at certain times and. Yeah, it's a it's been a really in, in, interesting evolution, mm. I reckon, over the last fifteen years in terms of just watching that whole recovery space. Obviously, diet and nutrition is critical. Massive. Can't stress that enough. I mean, you, you know, you get these young young players come into the AFL system, and they're 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 great, and they're, but they're kids, mm -hmm. and some of them haven't even yet established what a good diet is for them. Mm -hmm. And it does vary between individuals. I mean, mm -hmm. We've all got different basal metabolic rates and all mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But some of these kids are coming in and they're, and, they're, and they're thinking that 12 pieces of toast is a great breakfast. Yes. You know, and just having a good dietitian work with them and take yeah. them under their wing and educate them around what generally is good, but mm. then dig deeper about what, what you actually need. Because we've worked... We've had some case studies with elite athletes that have such ridiculously high basal metabolic rates that they're doing a 10K run in their sleep. Yeah, right. So they need to eat more. So what, what you would think is enough. Is not enough. And this wow. might be the kid. If that was me. This was <laughs> me too. Um, and this might be the kid that's had, you know, a few little stress reactions or something like that. And, 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 and it's got to do with this energy deficit. Yeah. But he hasn't got enough fuel in there to do the adapting to the load you're giving him. Yeah. Or her. And and I think that's also for, you know, people in general. People have to work out what works for them. Um, and 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 what you're saying about tendons and overloading and things, I know my brother often says, you know, if people, you know, often he wouldn't have to do surgery if some people just lost weight. So, you know, weight's a big thing. Um Huge. and particularly when you're running, uh, the force that goes through Massive. you is a lot, right? And through your knees and your hips and so whatever you can do. It's always good yeah. in terms of having a healthy diet, and as you said, as you, when you when you start moving, you eat better and and you sleep better, and then that's better for your body too. I don't want ever anyone to focus on their weight. I don't think that's you know healthy, I agree. Um, but I think it's as as you progress into the fitness and health world, it's just a natural progression. But it's not something to be like looking at yourself all about. You know, it's not about the scales. It's about how you feel. That's what. And when you concentrate on how you feel. Spot on. Yeah. And, you know, with some people, if they start a bit of strength work and a bit of exercise, they might lose some fat, but they might gain some muscle. And so their weight might come down a bit, but they're, but they're a whole lot healthier mm. because, it, because they've lost a bit of fat, but they've gained a bit of muscle. So the relative loss is not as much as you'd expect, but muscle's helping their basal metabolic rate. It's helping protect their joints. It's keeping them healthier. It's helping hormonal levels. So it's all good. So it's not just about that weight number. Mm, that's right. You know, which people get fixated on. Yep. I want to ask you, Steve, because I would like it for myself. Mm -hmm. What's your biggest tip to me as a coach of people and their bodies? Can I give you two tips? Yeah, Is you can just... give me ten tips, please. <laughs> Top of my head. Uh huh. Talk to the athlete often and listen. Talk to them to listen. Don't tell them. Because. They sort of know, even if they've got the wrong opinion, 
what they tell you is really, really useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so having a great relationship with the athlete, talking to them a lot and really listening help, helps me often see, oh, so you really believe it. You really believe the foam roller is going to stop delayed onset muscle soreness. Wow. What have I got to do to educate you around that? So there's that. So just talking and listening mm -hmm. is, is just massive. Mm -hmm. And then the other one for me as a, as, a, as, as a coach would just be objectivity to support that. So, you know, I know you're thinking and feeling that, but what, what, what do we know? What can we measure? Because mm -hmm. so, sometimes my impressions or the athlete's impressions are out in that wrong. But if you're objective and you're measuring, mm -hmm. it sort of keeps you on the straight and narrow. You yeah. know, so, so if you're not sure, what, what can I measure about that? Like you mentioned sleep before, if your sleeping pattern's all wrong, get it tested, mm. you know, and you might get a surprise and find out you've got narcolepsy or you've mm, got, you know, that's right. whatever, or your basal metabolic rate's here. Or you might think, oh, look, I've, I've tested some athletes, like in the NFL, unbelievable levels of strength. These guys are machines <laughs> and they walk into the room and they go, <laughs> Like, like, yeah. this guy's strong. And then you start testing him around the hips. This guy can clean 200 kilos and he can do all these big lifts or whatever. And you start testing him around the hips and you find out there's two muscle groups around his hips that are no better than my mother's. Yeah, right. You Isn't know? that interesting? But if you don't measure, yeah. you don't know. Mm. So that objectivity and measurement mm. and talking and listening, yep. I reckon, are the big things for me, yeah. which, is, which is probably a coach biased by science and medicine yeah yeah but uh, it's but, definitely but, for me yeah. is talking one-on-one -on -one and listening to people but certainly I've, I've i've done a lot of coaching of track and field athletes and athletes from a variety of sports and one of the most useful things for me at the end of every training session was just to walk a couple of laps around the track and talk yeah and you know when you can see you know bodies people's different bodies and different things you know often i've got people who are training out there and you know I, I really encourage them to bring their shoulders back and, and start using a band or something like that um, and giving useful advice like that i guess you know from your perspective sometimes i go in and look at gyms and compare myself to other trainers and things and i'll see things that other trainers are doing and i start to get itchy and i you know <laughs> but i'm sure it comes from you know for you that yeah, must be yeah. you know so thank you for your um, opinions there because listening is really key to my training yeah. and I think that's part of um, you know anyone that I train is that they have that ability to access me like I have the ability because I come to you as my physio and you give me lots of information so surrounding yourself with knowledge and people that can help you to better yourself because yeah. everyone's out there I mean you've done a lot of study so you learn something from every patient every client and every athlete that you know you work with um, if you just listen and remain objective there's just so much to learn every day which which makes it really cool and exciting really well, one last question one yeah, last yeah. question how important is the core for running sweet spot of mind i really important mm -hmm. so you know, there was this person called slocum back in 68 that was the first to sort of say you know the, the core is everything in athletic performance sort of thing and there's been a million people say it beforehand as a matter of fact per first person to talk about it core stability with regards to the spine was actually in Leonardo da Vinci. Is that right? Believe it or not. Gosh, he, he. So in his treatise back at the turn of the 15th century, he wrote about that. Wow. Which is pretty cool, isn't it? But, but yeah, yeah, look, it's really important and it's an area that can be easily forgotten. Yes. You know, we want to do the big lift. We want to strengthen the upper body. We want to strengthen the legs. Don't forget the thing in the middle. And so what's, what's some good little exercises that people can do? Simple things. Oh, it depends on what you're doing and, mm -hmm. and, and what you need to pre prepare for. So say for running? Uh, so for running, abdominal work's really important, but from the lower end, so not just crunches, you need to be doing abdominal work where you're controlling a neutral spine and then you're working your legs, so leg lifts and leg shoots and those sorts of variations um, are, are good to make sure that you're doing that sort of work, not just with a, a dominant rectus abdominis, which is the washboard muscle down the front, you need to make sure that when you're doing your abdominal work, you are also using the deeper layers like the obliques and the transverse abdominis. Because if you're not, you won't have rotary control um, and the rectus abdominis has no attachment to your spine. Right. So while it can control your rib cage and your pelvis, it does little to control your spine. Whereas the oblique muscles, 
attach a wrap around the sides and they mm -hmm. attach into something called your thoracolumbar fascia, mm -hmm. which comes back and attaches into your vertebrae. Mm -hmm. So those muscles are better at controlling your intra-abdominal pressure mm -hmm. and they have more direct attachments to your spine. So they're really good at protecting your spine. Mm -hmm. And what your spine does when you run and move is really important to your movement efficiency. So abdominal work that that is done in the right way. So you're using those corset muscles, not just the washboard muscle at the front, are really, really important. Um, so you need rotary control. And, you know, obviously your back and your gluteal and hip muscles are really important too. So like being being strong from mid-thigh to your rib cage with, with good control is very important. And it's... It, I get the privilege of seeing a lot of people come to me from around the world with chronic groin pain and the number of times you screen them and, and you find deficits in those muscle groups that when tidied up, see their dysfunction and then their groin pain wash away. Wow. Um, is quite, um, quite reaffirming to me at how important conditioning those muscles is. Mm. Yeah, because a lot of times I hear, "Oh, my glute glute muscles are weak." You know, people, the physios are always yeah, saying, "Glute yeah, muscles, glute muscles are weak." And yeah, that's a bit overcooked. Some yeah. sometimes too, yeah. like um, my glutes don't activate. Well, I think they do, <laughs> <laughs> but you you might have some hip rotators or hip abductors that aren't strong enough or mm. something. But um, yeah, it's not it's not quite as simple as the glute doesn't activate. There's a bit more to it than that. Yeah, yeah, so I think the long and the short of this interview is that people need to get health screening. They need to um, have a physio, particularly if they're beginning, um, and see them through a marathon program. So it is, it is really important because you can get injured early and it's really good to prevent it before it happens. Yep. Um, and, Absolutely. And, and make sure that you're on top of it. So before you get that chronic injury, you know, just be uh, mindful. So I always try and see, see Steve or my other physio as um, often as I can. That's uh, great. When it's really chronic, I come to Spot you. Spot on. And <laughs> like just a little bit of advice early. Yes. One or two visits, a little bit of advice, learn some exercises, get some measurement that can save a whole lot of trouble later on. Thanks, Steve. No really worries, appreciate Anna. your time. Fantastic. Thank you.